good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Metadata Driven Cleanup of Files, Content, and Email. This is Steve Mann, Vice President of Sales at Concept Searching. I will be one of your co-hosts for today's webinar. Uh, I have been in the managed uh, metadata space for several years now and really spend most of my time focused on business development and account management. Joining me is Mike Pei, Concept Searching's Chief Technology Officer. Uh, Mike, you want to tell the folks a bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. So uh, I've been in the Concept Searching team now for a little over five years, and I head up our UK-based development team, uh, predominantly focusing on our SharePoint technologies, but also working on our classification engine, bringing it to more and more platforms. Um, as we go through. Um, I'll be focusing today on the, the demos while Steve will be leading the presentation. So uh, back to you, Steve. Okay, thanks, Mike. All right, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and we'll send all registrants a link to the recording as well as a link to the presentation. Uh, if you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. Uh, more than likely, we will end up following up after this webinar with a response uh, with it within the next few days. Uh, you know, interestingly, last night I, I saw a commercial that I, I believe made light of the notion of uh, death or torture by PowerPoint. And, uh, you know, certainly we want to avoid uh, inflicting similar uh, uh, treatment on you all today. Uh, that said, I'm going to say that uh, some of the slides you might find to be somewhat content enriched. And I think my suggestion would be maybe listen more to the words, at least with regard to the PowerPoint, and, and think of the slides as a source of uh, reference later on if you care to revisit uh, this topic, or uh, an excellent reference for anyone who you maybe you want to share something, uh, share this with who didn't have a chance to uh, actually listen to the webinar. Okay, so our agenda for today, we will lead off with a bit about uh, who, con who concept searching is and what we do, uh, touch upon the components of metadata-driven cleanup of file shares, content, uh, email, and we'll discuss content optimization. And as Mike mentioned, he'll be showing you how it all works and we actually have uh, broken up his, or rather he has broken up his demonstration into two sections. So again, try to mitigate the, the PowerPoint effect on you all. For those of you that perhaps do not know who we are, we have been around for some 16 years. Uh, we're focused on metadata generation, auto classification, and taxonomy management, with many of the world's largest corporations deploying our platform. Our, our software is platform agnostic, and while much of the content of this webinar series uses SharePoint as the main focus, we are by no means a SharePoint-only platform. And we are also the only solution in the market with a fully integrated, statistical, multi-term, auto-classification platform, which we use to deliver metadata-driven search and governance solutions. Many organizations have tried to leverage metadata to manage content. However, most end up relying on their end users to manually tag content, and that's where plans go awry. Now, the reality is that metadata needs to be tagged consistently and accurately to deliver value. And that is simply not going to happen when content is tagged manually. We've listed some of the typical dynamics associated with manual tagging here on this slide. Now, our unique uh, compound term processing technology is really our key differentiator in the industry. Uh, compound term processing enables the identification and the correct weighting of multi-word concepts in unstructured text. So our contention is that a multi-word result is more valuable than single words. And to illustrate, we have our tried and true example of triple heart bypass. Now, when I say triple heart bypass, you all consciously or subconsciously probably thought, okay, open heart surgery. Now, the point we're trying to emphasize in breaking up the multi-word phrase into the single words that make up that phrase is that the meaning of the single words are far different than the meaning of the multi-word phrase. So if your search engine relies on keyword search, as most do, you may still find documents in your results set that are about triple heart bypass. 
However, you are also likely to find many irrelevant documents that only contain the word triple or heart or bypass. Now, not only will concept searching uh, return a more refined and relevant result set, but because we can identify the concept behind triple heart bypass, it will also return related concepts such as coronary surgery, heart attack, pulmonary embolism, or stroke, because it has captured the concept within the content. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mike for uh, your first demonstration. Thank you, Steve, that's great. Right then, so I'm gonna start off in SharePoint today, um, but I really do want to emphasize the point that Steve made a moment ago, that we are not a SharePoint only platform, but it emphasizes the way that auto classification can be used from an end user perspective. So to illustrate some of the technologies that are at play here, I'm going to pretend I'm a standard knowledge management user and I'm using SharePoint as my knowledge management center. But of course, this could be any type of system. It could potentially be a file system where we've integrated in some custom way. It could be a proprietary system that sits within your own organization, or it may be one of the other, um, for example, CMIS sources that sits out there um, that, not a, sorry, that manages your knowledge content within your organization. So what Concept Searching has done with this particular Knowledge Management Center is come in and looked at all of the documents within this particular library. And then what it's done is analyze the content using our compound term processing technology to statistically rank the classifications that are relevant for these documents. And it's then applying them back to the library so that the end users can be have improved search, can refine down their content very easily, and can potentially take action on those documents based on what they're seeing with that tagging. And what it really means is that those users that are perhaps uploading content that don't always understand the content they're uploading, perhaps because they're managing it for someone else or as part of a team, and it could be a 100, 150 page document, they then don't have to sit there reading the whole document to gain the understanding of what that document contains. They can review the summary that Concept Searching provides them, as well as the tagging that's provided automatically within the library, and then they can use that to take the actions that they need. So what we're looking at here, as I say, is the documents that already exist within this library. But what's more important from an end user perspective is actually what happens when they're uploading documents and managing the content on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm going to do is go across to a new folder within that library and I'm going to look at what happens when we take some content in. So the first thing I'm going to do is drag a few documents into that library. And so what's going to happen now is Concept Searching has a fairly native integration with SharePoint as mentioned earlier. So some hooks that we have in the SharePoint software are going to fire off to the Concept Searching server. And those hooks allow us to pick up on those document changes, make sure that we're kept appraised of any differences that have occurred in the environment and ensure that they're classified in a timely fashion. Now, of course, you could argue in some respects that you could classify these on the fly as the user uploads the document. But the reality is that as SharePoint moves forward and other, as other knowledge management systems move forward, we're going to be uploading more and more content, potentially in bulk. So the last thing you want to do is detract from the experience of the end user and slow the whole upload process down. So instead, we fire off these lightweight events and process in the background, but ultimately providing those classifications back to the end user as quickly as possible. While we wait for that background process to occur, though, what I'm going to do is upload a single document so we can look at the more rich experience that the Concept Search software can allow us to provide. And as I say, this uses our built-in APIs, which can be integrated integrated into whichever platform you desire, whether that's a custom proprietary platform or using it within, for example, SharePoint interface. So as I upload the document, we're going to see a few things that occur within the UI. So first of all, we've, we can see that uh, auto has been tagged against uh, these particular fields. We can also then see that uh, a couple of seconds later, almost too quick for demonstration purposes, but the classifications have been sent back from Concept Searching Server to automatically populate this field. So we've got a few different things at play here. We've got uh, information retrieval being listed against this document. So based on the words and phrases that we found within this document, we're categorizing this as the subject information retrieval. So that can be used for our search um, retrieval or potentially for better categorizing documents within our centers. 
But what we've also noticed is that the document contains certain confidential information. So we've identified that this document contains a visa card, which is personally identifiable information. So a couple of things have occurred because of that. We can see that we've obviously got the uh, tags coming along, identifying that it is a visa card. But what we've also done, just for demonstration purposes, is pulled the identified visa card number out of the document and pushed it into the metadata field on the form. Obviously, that's not something we'd want to do in a real life scenario for a visa card number, but hopefully it highlights to you the power of concept searching with regards to identifying entities within a document, pulling them out and then populating them onto a form. And again, as I say, all of this can be leveraged in whichever platform you desire on our supported list or potentially through a proprietary platform using one of our other connectors. What we can also see from this particular form is how concept searching has tagged it. So one of the experiences we have available to us is the view classifications link. And what this allows us to do is see the scoring engine behind the scenes that concept searching is using to tag this particular document. So if we expand out, we can see in this particular um, taxonomy, we have the clue information retrieval. So we're looking for the compound term information retrieval in that document. We've identified that it's occurred within the document four times and that thus we've applied a weighted score. And concept searching always works on a weighted basis. So we use scores and thresholds so that we can rank lots of different potential subjects that a document is about and pick the best ones. And that's really a very key uh, behavior of our software. So that if, for example, we're looking at different confidentiality levels within, um, within our documents, we ensure we always apply, for example, the highest level of confidentiality rather than if, say, we have a few rules that match that it's a public document but actually it contains some very sensitive information so we consider it confidential we wouldn't ever want to apply the public label we would always want to apply the confidential label particularly if we're looking to implement things like irm um, and other security policies there's one other bit of functionality i will demonstrate here and that's the view duplicates and what you, uh, I'm hoping you've noticed with this particular document is I've actually uploaded an image here. So not only is concept searching auto classified this, but actually when that document was sent back to the concept searching server, we ran OCR over the document, extracted as much text as we could. And that even involved in this case, extracting then a visa card number from that particular image. But what we can actually do as well is view documents that match the text within that document. So what I'm saying here is we're not looking for necessarily the documents that are the same checksum. So we're not doing a very, very close detection. What we're actually doing is a very fuzzy duplicate detection to identify those documents that contain, contain the same words and phrases in a, a fuzzy um, standard. Uh, all of this is very much configurable um, on the end user side. So we can say what sort of percentage matches we're looking for. We can say um, what sort of text length differences we're looking for. So if we consider that uh, if something's 50% in length different, then perhaps that is a duplicate, but actually it's a very old archived copy and that's okay. So what this is, what this has provided to us is the identification of another document, which is interestingly is actually the same one in a different location of this uh, SharePoint environment. So we can see that it's picked out the text of the two and identified that one as a duplicate for us. So from a knowledge management perspective, as I'm uploading my files, if I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm uploading this, but someone else in the team might have as well. I immediately get a picture of the documents within this center and I can say, okay, actually, that other member of my team has uploaded this, I don't need to. Or potentially another version exists, but it is an outdated copy. And I think we all know within file systems and all of our knowledge management repositories or management repositories, um, there are content or there is content that is duplicated. So this is one of those ways that we can identify the duplicates that are occurring as we're bringing content in and start to stem the flow of those duplicates. What I'm going to do now is just close out of that. So hopefully what we'll see when the screen refreshes from closing out is that auto classification has occurred in the background for the remainder of the documents. And there we go. So what we can see is all of the tags that have been written back for those documents. In the case of the majority of them, we're not looking at that personally identifiable information. What we're actually looking at is much more text rich documents that contain lots of information. And those have then been categorized into um, the particular subjects that are most appropriate for them. What I will do very quickly is just do another view duplicates display. So we can actually do that from the uh, library level. 
And again, what this really enables us to do is identify where that document has occurred, potentially in other locations. So we can see that I've got uh, two different versions of this document, one in a personal folder and one uh, at the very root level of this library. So I hope this drives home the power that concept searching can bring in terms of both auto classification and our compound term processing. And it really is that compound term processing technology that is at the heart of all of the functionality that we've just seen here in terms of accurately tagging those documents based on the statistical analysis of them, but also being able to statistically analyze the duplicates that are in the background. I'm going to take a look very quickly at how that auto classification works, but I won't uh, get too bogged down on that because what I want to move on to is all of the different source types that we support and the ways in which we can drive our auto classification rules. So here we have some of the rules that we're employing to auto categorize our documents. So we have some words and we have some compound terms and all of that terminology is being used to identify when a document is about a particular subject. And in this case, the subject is environment. So we've got a few different words that we as an organization consider appropriate for a document to contain if it should be categorized. So the real power behind concept searching is that we don't just have to use the functionality and the, the text that we've got here. You can use your own business language to identify which documents are important to you. So you can define your own business words and phrases that allow you to map your files into a particular category. One of the key things behind this and the key purposes of this is that if we've got documents dating back maybe 20, 30 years, we might have uh, projects or potentially um, products that have gone over a very long time period. And during that time period, the naming conventions around them have changed. Potentially the people that have been working on those projects have changed. The product references have almost certainly changed over that time as marketing has evolved and as how the platform um, has been deployed has evolved or the product has been deployed has evolved. So what concept searching allows you to do is define all of the language that is appropriate for a particular subject so that you can find all of those documents, whether they're 20 years old or five years old, allowing your end users to very quickly look at those documents and find the ones that are most appropriate for that particular product, not only because they are about that subject, but also potentially because they are the more recent documents. So we support a number of different classification rules to achieve this. All the ones we look at here are the standard text-based clues that I mentioned earlier. So we're looking for the words and phrases within those documents. But I do want to just emphasize, we can also write a number of other classification rule types, such as metadata rules, where we might be looking at, say, the author of the document or the location of the document. We can also write regular expression rules. A key use case for that is actually much like the demo I described earlier, or I showed earlier, when we have our Visa card numbers, we can pull those out or any other pattern that we have within our organization. Perhaps we might be looking for uh, patent numbers or, or something to that effect within our documents. We also have a few other types that I won't go into too deeply, but we have, for example, case sensitive clues if we're looking for uh, product references, language clues if we only want to apply a particular term, if we're looking at, say, French documents or German documents as well as certain ways such as static and hierarchical and required terms and term boosts, which allow us to build relationships between the terms in our taxonomies. So a good, a good expression of this is, for example, if a document is tagged as motorcycles, we would almost certainly want it to also be tagged as automobiles. So we can build a link between those two terms so that we don't have to keep repeating the same terminology time and time again, really improving the end user efficiency of our knowledge managers and the people that are responsible for managing our taxonomies. Without further ado, I'm going to go over to an example source list of some of the repository types that Concept Searching supports. So in this list here, I've got an Exchange server, which has a number of mailboxes within it. And if we drill down, what we can see is some of the information that these documents contain that we can use to classify our documents. So if I expand this out, we get given, uh, first of all, just a very high level overview from concept searching of the kind of information that we um, use for auditing purposes. But what we can also see is the full text that has been extracted the classifications that have been applied to the document. And we can also go so far as to look at the full metadata for the document, um, which allows us to see some of the information that has come from the Exchange server. So we can see the uh, two information, so who those emails were sent to, 
the subject of the email, as well as some other information such as when the email was first created, when it was received, and when it was sent. Concept searching supports crawling at either a mail server level or a mailbox level, so it can be used to a degree for e-discovery, as well as sensitive information detection within mailboxes or within mailbox folders. Going back to my top level list, as we saw earlier, SharePoint is obviously a big part of what we do, and we have our SharePoint sources listed here. And we also have, for example, our file sources. So again, if we look through, we see a good amount of information, the documents having been expanded and drilled down from our crawling process, looking at those folders. And then we've got the full properties available to us to allow us to write our auto classification rules. One of the important things to note from a file system perspective is we don't have just the uh, file properties themselves, i.e. the ones from um, the access date and the modified date of the file system. We also have the properties that come out of the files themselves. So anything that uh, comes out of the Office properties um, of a Microsoft Office file or potentially out of a PDF. Um, when there are custom properties at play. So this fits in quite nicely with things like the Titus uh, security system, whereby we can read those security labels and we can also write those labels back to the files if required. Going back up to the top level again, um, the same applies to all of the different sources we support. So we can see here we have content server, we have a SQL server database that's being crawled, a standard website, a box source, all of these sources are supported in the exact same manner and go through the exact same classification process. So we write our classification rules and then apply them to all of our repository types. And it's important to note that as with uh, file system, as I showed a moment ago, and exchange, we always pull as much information out as possible to ensure our classification can be as accurate as possible, looking at both the metadata in the source system and the metadata in the files themselves to allow you to write those very generic classification rules and start securing your data and cleaning up your data in as quick a time period as possible. I'm now going to pass back to Steve to continue on with the presentation and then we'll look at uh, a bit more on file system processing later on. Back to you, Steve. All right. Thanks, Mike. OK, so let's talk about uh, dark data and rot. Uh, unfortunately, uh, content that pervades uh, most organizations these days. Uh, dark data is data an organization does not know exists, uh, which presents challenges around identifying and assessing its value. Uh, shadow IT flies under the radar of IT. It's actually becoming a much larger problem due to the cloud. Uh, companies attempt to address shadow IT by blocking the known risky services as they pop up. But you know, this, uh, th this whack-a-mole approach may partially address the problem, but it also addresses the risk of employees finding other cloud services that are less known and possibly riskier. To give you an idea of the extent of shadow IT, the average organization uh, used a whopping 1,427 cloud services in Q3 of 2016, uh, representing a nearly 24% growth over the same quarter in the previous year. Only 8% of cloud services have been certified as secure. So more concern, 71% of employees use applications not approved by their IT department. For those of you not familiar with the term ROT, uh, ROT refers to redundant, obsolete, or trivial data, somewhat self-explanatory. Uh, ROT can refer to physical as well as electronic information, including email. Now, getting rid of rot is more easily accomplished by getting rid of what you don't know exists. Dark data is trickier as it can be business critical or useless, or worse, can cause the organization harm, such as data exposure. For example, what if an old client list existed on a file share? Now that said, most organizations have determined that if a certain period of time has passed since data was accessed or changed, a statute of limitations, if you will, then data could be eliminated. Three years is that period for many. 
I've heard organizations preferring to wait as long as seven years, sometimes even longer. Now, the point is, if you can zero in on a time frame and implement a consistent policy to support it, you will minimize rot. A third of all content in an unmanaged server is rot, and it can be as much as 70% rot. So why does this happen? You know, I think there are two main reasons. Uh, you know, when in doubt, the average person will save versus delete. Uh, secondly, you know, the typical employee is inclined to leverage company resources for personal use whenever possible. Uh, maybe to take a simple analogy, I think uh, probably all of us uh, at, at some time maybe have been guilty of uh, liberating uh, office supply closet in our in our company of you know anything from you know a pen post-it pad of paper you know somehow that finds uh, finds its way to our homes and uh, you know I I don't think I've ever run into anyone who uh, uh, shall we say turned or you know made critical comments about that I, I think most people feel like it's uh, almost like they're entitled you know part of the whole mentality of being overworked and underpaid and hey you know why not take a little something that probably costs the company you know pennies, you know, next to nothing. And I think that same mentality uh, translates over to uh, to storage. Hey, the company probably gets a great deal on storage, so why not, you know, let me keep all my, you know, personal photos or documents um, on, you know, at, at the expense of the company's uh, storage. Okay, with regard to organizational risk, just one example that uh, probably most are not aware of. 92% of organizations have stolen email credentials for sale on the dark web. A rot causes other uh, issues for organizations, some of which are listed here. Uh, the notion of keeping everything forever because storage is cheap or because ser uh, search technology uh, has improved is, mis is misguided and risky for simple reasons. So the reality is no matter how cheap the storage is, the more information being stored, the greater the cost. It takes more time for any search tool to browse through cluttered repositories versus cleaner repositories. Search analytics and e-discovery tools take longer to create output and produce less reliable results when applied to larger rot-filled information volumes. Using the wrong version of information or obsolete information leads to mistakes and bad decisions. Uh, this can cost money or even be life-threatening depending on the industry. In short, rot leads to higher inefficiency and risk. Reducing rot, by contrast, increases efficiency and lowers risk. So the key question is who is responsible, IT or the business user? Well, IT doesn't necessarily know the business value of the content. And as mentioned, the business uh, user will uh, be inclined to keep it just in case it is needed at a future date. Now, Mike is going to demonstrate uh, most of these capabilities, so I won't spend too much time here. Uh, although cleaning up files uh, achieves numerous advantages with regard to ROT, one of the other benefits that I think is important is the value that can also be identified in dark data. In the course of deploying concept searching and cleaning up its content, one of our legal clients found dark data. Since then, they have identified two new practice areas based on information they found and didn't realize they had. It's information capital that has a monetary value. The approach to data privacy and records management is essentially the same. In both cases, a taxonomy would be deployed that includes data privacy and sensitive information. In the case of records management, a taxonomy would be created that matched the file plan. And we can protect organizationally defined sensitive information in real time. Now, this is becoming more important in the cloud, specifically with OneDrive for Business. Uh, using concept taxonomy workflow, vulnerabilities can be automatically moved to a secure repository and portability prevented, in addition uh, to notifications to the appropriate staff for resolution. One of the concerns is end-user tagging of records and policies that rely on manual, human-based approaches. 
There are other solutions that provide auto classification capabilities, but they can't extract excerpts in the form of phrases and keywords to assist records managers with the classification process. In addition, they are typically quite complicated and burdensome. Eliminating end user tagging provides the organization with a reliable metadata framework and repository of relevant terminology based on their unique corpus of content. Where the regulation or compliance requirement can be defined, workflows can be defined, which are transparent to the end user. Our technology is based on taxonomies and designed for the subject matter expert, regardless of role within the organization. It was our premise that these employees would know the most about their content and actions that should take place. Our taxonomy manager tool is easy to use with many features that are still unique in the market. It is highly interactive and intuitive, resulting in a rapid learning curve. With regard to analytics, the data set can be optimized and the noise eliminated before analysis. We provide the cleanup of the content to be used. Organizations can have multiple intelligence tools, ranging from an Excel spreadsheet to artificial intelligence. The data set can be easily imported using any business intelligence tool, as well as artificial intelligence tools. This can be accomplished through manual import or drag and drop capabilities. Okay, now passing it back to Mike for his second demonstration. Thank you, Steve, that's great. So what I'm going to be looking at now is a bit of an extension on what I was looking at earlier. But instead of focusing on SharePoint, this time I'm going to be focusing on file system and a problem that uh, I expect most people that are watching this webinar have experienced at one time or another. And that's both having files that uh, perhaps shouldn't be where they are, perhaps because they're old or perhaps because they contain sensitive content, and also files that uh, contain such information as PII. So I'm categorizing in two, two different um, areas here. I've got my confidential information, and in this case, I'm looking for old confidential information. And I've also got my security credit card information. So what this demo is going to focus on is combining two of the technologies that Concept Searching offer. So it's both our classification engine and our workflow engine. And I will just clarify that when I describe our workflow engine, what I'm talking about is not uh, one of the other engines that's on the market, but our own proprietary technology that fits in with our classification technology to allow an end user to perform specific actions as and when specific classifications occur. So what I've got uh, on the screen now is a workflow that's configured to perform a few different actions based on um, some specific rules. So in this case, what I'm looking for is confidential information that is of a certain date. So what I'm looking there for is a dynamic metadata rule where the age of the document is older than a particular period, in this case, 2010. And the other one I'm looking for is that the document is not encrypted. So over the right here, we can see not classified for the encrypted term. So I'm using all of these already predefined terms within my taxonomy to then drive two actions. And in this case, I've got uh, an action to alert me of the identification of this information and also an action to encrypt the file using uh, Azure RMS encryption. So ensuring that only someone within the organization or someone that has sharing rights can then access that file. But if this particular workflow rule doesn't run, so we haven't identified that it's confidential and we haven't uh, tried to encrypt it, instead what we're going to do is move on to the next rule. And that rule says, if I've identified a credit card number within the file, I'm going to migrate it to a different repository, in this case, box. I'm going to delete the item on our file system. So whatever the user has done, they've put it in a particular location and I disagree with the location they've used. So I'm going to delete it from there. And what I'm also going to do is perform redaction on that document. So I've identified a credit card number in there and we've already seen that those entities that we've identified can be pulled out. But in this case, what I'm going to actually do is replace those entities and replace them with a particular text redacted. So without further ado, I'm going to look at the uh, location that uh, is being monitored in this particular occasion. So we've got here um, a folder called monitored 
And that particular folder is being indexed by concept searching. So that means we have a number of hooks that sit within um, the software, looking at that file system location with events triggering as and when documents are added or updated in a similar way to SharePoint. So what I'll do now is drag those documents in there. So if I go back to our sources, what we can see is that those documents should fairly quickly pop up in there. So we can see we've got a few documents now. All of them are coming across through the system now. And we can already see that concept searching has crawled those documents when they've been brought in. It's found the content within them. And it's now classified them. So if we keep refreshing, there we go. So they've now been processed through all of the different stages of the concept searching auto classification process. And what I'd expect to see, because of uh, some of the rules that we've got in place, which was to remove those documents having migrated them, we can see that a few of those have gone to a deleted status. So we can see document automatically deleted. So what is important to note from this particular demo is that concept searching has not only identified the sensitive information, but also left the information that wasn't relevant to those workflow rules. So we can very easily define lots of business policies with the workflow engine in combination with the classification engine to cherry pick the documents that we're most concerned about and perform actions on them. If I go across to my logs, I can very quickly see a log of the actions that have been taken on those documents. So at uh, eight minutes past five in my time, we can see that three different documents were migrated up to box. And I can also see one of the documents I moved in there had an email alert triggered and also had the Azure encryption applied to it. So if I go back to that folder, we can see some of those documents has been removed as we would expect. We can see one of those documents has a modified date just now because of the application of that RMS processing. And if I open that document, we can see the IRM policy being applied as I open it. So that, uh, I hope, is a very quick demonstration of the kind of power that concept searching can use. We support not only the ability to perform built-in actions, but also the ability to write your own custom actions should you want to. To finish off, what I'm going to do is just come along to the folder and box that I have. And if I refresh this page, we can see the documents that uh, have been pushed up there by the workflow engine. And if I go into one of those, what we can expect to see is certain information being redacted from that document. And as we scroll down, we have that visa card number that uh, we pulled out in the earlier demonstration has been redacted and removed, as well as a number of other key um, patterns that have been identified by our classification rules and then automatically redacted during that migration process. So if we go to uh, one of these other documents, this is a nice demo one with quite a lot of redaction. In it. <laughs> but again, we can see that same redaction being applied to those documents as part of that migration process into a sensitive location. So this technology is particularly useful when we're looking at perhaps public repositories that we know should never contain particular types of information to allow us to either redact them in place or potentially move them to a secure location. I hope um, that demonstration hopefully hopefully shows all of the different functionality that concept surgeon can provide but obviously as um, was mentioned at the beginning if you do have any questions please do feel free to drop us an email and we'll get back to you with um, more information on that particular demo or demos that are adjacent to that that you think could be useful for your organization so without any further ado back to you Steve thanks Mike Okay, home stretch, folks. Uh, so avoiding clutter. As with protecting uh, confidential data, there are actions, action items IT and business leaders can uh, can take to help prevent the over proliferation of rot. Most companies across the board fail to allocate time for training, so be sure to allow enough time for that. Simple enough. Policies and procedures that support compliance guidelines can be implemented. That can help mitigate rot. With regard to content analysis, content not officially defined as ROT can still be off message, inappropriate, or fail to comply with company guidelines. So don't uh, overlook that. Identifying and eliminating abandoned content uh, can help minimize clutter. 
And when it comes to content analysis, human judgment will still be a key to proper and thorough analysis. So we can't completely automate that. You know, in the end, if you're still afraid or if in doubt, move it offline or quarantine it. Outside of the training of end users and content analysis, all the other bullet points are supported by our content optimization solution. We can identify abandoned content within a certain percentage of time. Because trivial information usually lies outside the definition of a record, most companies handle it through policies, procedures, and training. For example, a policy defining what constitutes a record usually defines the final version as a record while excluding the working versions and drafts. The policy should go on to require that non-records, like working versions and drafts, be destroyed as soon as the final is established. Training is also necessary to place the responsibility of properly destroying trivial information on employees and to prevent information hoarding, which is a common mentality. Whatever procedures are implemented, make them transparent to the end users. Once you find your problems and gain buy-in, you'll want to perform the content optimization, uh, perform the creation of the data to be analyzed and refine that, and export to a tool of your choice. Easier said than done, but the benefits are worth it. And some of the benefits include uh, enhanced search, intelligent migration, efficient records management, security processes, GDPR uh, compliance, and content lifecycle management. So we'd love to help. Uh, often the most sensible first step is an exploratory chat so we can better understand your requirements and what you're looking to accomplish. From there, we can both decide if it makes sense for us to go down the path a bit further. Uh, as Mike said, we'd be happy to schedule a capabilities briefing that includes a live demonstration uh, for you and your colleagues. Uh, a good number of our clients became clients after we worked together to set up a proof of concept in their environment. Uh, the concept searching solution at work customized to deliver results for specific use cases with that client's own content. Uh, please join us for our next webinar, Discovery, Risk, and Insight in a Metadata-Driven World. And finally, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we will be sending out a copy of the webinar and the slides in the next couple of days, along with responses to any questions that have been raised. Uh, if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us or our marketing team. And you all have a great day and a great week.